Praise the Lord. We're at soap as we pray together. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name because you've gathered us together. Thank you for journey mercies you granted your people. Lord, we pray tonight. You open our eyes to behold wonderful, glorious things in your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, Lord, that your word will be a blessing. The hearing of the word will be a blessing. The teaching of the word will be a blessing to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. And to all our brothers and sisters, members of the same Christian family, studying the word of God with us tonight, Lord, we pray you grant us a spirit of understanding, illumination, and light upon your word in Jesus' name. And like you made the Christians in Thessalonica real model and example, we pray, Lord, our lives and lifestyle, our character, our behavior, our action, our response to your word will be a model to people around us in Jesus' name. And we pray that there will be a great impact of your word in our lives and in the lives of other people around us too. We praise you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can see that we're looking at Second Thessalonians. And we're starting from chapter 1. Today is the beginning of another episode. We've already finished the first epistle, and now we come to this second epistle to the Thessalonians. As you know already, the Thessalonian church was an exemplary church. It was a church that Paul the Apostle was proud of. And when he spoke about them, or spoke to them, or wrote to them, he said it was a church that was well-pleasing unto the Lord. In fact, he said they were the crown of rejoicing and glory to the apostle Paul, and then to his companions that followed after with him to, to witness to them, or to preach unto them. What made this church a well-pleasing church to God? What made the church a source of joy, an exemplary model to all the people? There are a number of things. Number one, there was the divine work of grace in their lives. The work of grace had been wrought, had been done. It brought them to repentance, brought them to faith, and then there was a turning around, a definite change in their lives because of that work of grace working in them. Not, not only that, they had genuine conversion. You know, there are people that say they are converted, but you cannot tell the difference between the old and the new. You cannot tell the difference between their midnight and their noon day. But in the case of these Thessalonian believers, they were really converted. They were genuinely converted and there was a marked a mark difference between the past and the new. Not only that, number three, there was that lively faith they had and the love and the hope. In fact, Paul the Apostle writing to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3, he says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope, your perseverance and persistence of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. And so you will see that this church we're talking about, they were a real church, a glorious church, a wonderful church, a church that Paul the Apostle actually wanted all the other churches to be like the church of the Thessalonians. And what marked them out was not only the fact that there was a work of grace, number two, that there was real conversion. Number three, there was the lively hope and faith and love. There was number four, the patience and the perseverance in persecution. This was a church that actually suffered. They suffered persecution, abuse, and insult, and assault, and, and conflicts from everywhere. But all the same, in the midst of it all, they were standing firm. They were patient. They were not a kind of impatient with the Lord, impatient with their problems, impatient with people. They knew it will come to an end one day. And because of that patience with the Lord and with the problem, they were persistent and they persevered in their faith. Number five, they had obedience and practical holiness. Obedience and practical holiness. It wasn't just that yes, we believe. Their faith actually made them to live the life that was glorifying to God, a life that brought beauty into the Christian faith, into the Christian life. Number six, you have read about them that they had well-known evangelistic zeal. And they focused on the expectation that the Lord will soon return. And because of that, they lived a life. A life that the apostle just said, I appreciate your life. I glorify God for you. This is wonderful. What if every church could be like that? In fact, as I look at them and I said, this is church. And you want to think about the church as C-H-U-R-C-H. That is church. These were converted hearts 
unitedly reflecting Christ's holiness. Think about the church, the church of Thessalonica. They were the cleansed hearts. They were the converted hearts. They were the committed hearts. And they were unitedly, all of them, not one remaining behind or one going ahead, but everybody united reflecting Christ's holiness. And that's what the church should be. And that's exactly what the church of the Thessalonians, that's what they were. And that is the reason why Paul the Apostle said, this is beautiful, this is glorious, and this is wonderful. What if every church could be like that? Nothing is said about the large membership of the church and nothing is said about their financial strength nothing is said about their wealth or their political power or their impressive position in society or popularity in their community you know there are some churches today all they're looking for is want to be so large and so big so that with a very great voice authoritative voice we'll be able to speak to the government the Thessalonian church was not like that. They were not worried about popularity. They were not worried about property. They were not worried about anything. All they wanted to do was to reflect Christ's holiness to their community. And because of that, they became a church that God said, this is a church. I want other people to be like that. What made the church great in the sight of the Lord was not uh, the, the physical things that people in fact about the experience of salvation that they were really saved. They were saved from their sins and saved from their, from their past and saved from self and they were sanctified. You think about them and then Paul the apostle said I'm praying for you. I know you are saved. There's no doubt about that. I know you have turned away from idols and you are following the living God. There's no doubt about that. I'm praying for you that spirit, soul, and body. The Lord will sanctify you entirely. And then he says, faithful is he who has called you who also will do it. Well, their salvation, well, their sanctification, they were steadfast. And they were unwavering in their commitment to the whole counsel of God. As taught of God and as taught of the leadership, the apostles that taught them, they were teachable. The lives reflected what they had been taught by God and taught by the apostles. This second epistle that was written to them some months after the first epistle actually relates what uh, Paul the apostle had prayed for. He had prayed for them. If you turn back to chapter 4, verses 1 and 10. First test, Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm looking at verse 4. It says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received a force, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would be abound more and more. He wanted their growth. He wanted them to reflect more of the glory of God, more of the holiness of Christ, and more of the love, and more of the faith, and more of the patience. He said, I want you to abound more and more. Look at verse 10. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but will beseech you, brethren, that ye increase how? more and more. And as we come to the second Thessalonians, he was so happy that, you know, what he had taught them or what he, what he wanted them to reflect, more of his grace, more of his love, and more of his patience, and more of his, more of his virtues, that now they had got it. That's why he's writing to them. Look at second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith grows exceedingly more and more, more and more. That's what he wanted. That's what he prayed for. That's what he touched them. And that is now what they produce. It says, now your faith grows exceedingly. And the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. And that's the reason why he was praising God for them, because he was really pleased, he was really challenged, he was really satisfied with their progress. And he wrote this epistle to guide them into fuller revelation while encouraging them to stand firm and remain faithful to the Lord in persecution and in all their trials. What if uh, you will be like that? I pray you'll be like that. I said you'll be like that. That constantly, by the grace of God, you'll be a kind of a converted heart, a converted person that is uh, unitedly with the church of God, reflecting Christ's holiness. And then, when the leaders see you, when our pastors, when they see you, when our pastors, when they see you, they say, we rejoice and we're glad because you are the crown of glory and the crown of rejoicing because you make the ministry 
beautiful. You make the ministry desirable because the word of God has worked so much in you and the grace of God has worked in you to produce these wonderful qualities. We're looking at the study today and the study today is, uh, is titled Thanksgiving for Exemplary Church Growth. Thanksgiving for this church that had grows that other people can emulate other people can copy we're going to divide the story to three parts number one enduring grace as foundation for believing enduring grace enduring grace the grace that comes the grace that continues the grace that arrives and the grace that abides and the grace that has a foundation the grace that is moving on and is flowing on the abiding grace and enduring grace as foundation for believing that that is we believe it will believe the lord and the foundation for that faith in the lord is the grace of God that abides and abounds. Number two, we're looking at exceedingly growing faith of the brethren. Oh, you see it already. I've read it to you already. That these believers in Thessalonica, they really grew. They really grew. And then the apostle referred to that. He said, I cannot stop talking about your believers in Thessalonica because your faith is growing exceedingly. Number three, exemplary godly fellowship among the believers. They just had fellowship. No division, no schism. And there was no kind of big me and little you. Everybody just united together, flow together, and had the same purpose, and they were progressing together in the things of the Lord, in the way of the Lord. They had this exemplary godly fellowship among themselves, and I pray that this will be experienced too in Jesus' name. We're coming to number one now, enduring grace as foundation for believing. Enduring grace as foundation for believing. Look at verses 1 and 2 of that chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 from verse 1. Paul and Silvanus, that Silas and Timothy, that Timothy, unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here Paul the apostle was writing and then he mentioned Timothy. He mentioned Silas. And some people might think that this episode was a joint episode. That is, the three of them sat down together around the table and then they were writing. Maybe uh, Paul the Apostle was dictating part of it and then Timothy was writing and then another time, uh, Timothy was, I have an idea. Can I give my idea? And then uh, Silvanus was saying, I want to contribute something to this. That was not, not at all. It was just Paul the Apostle that wrote this but because they were companions in labor that's why he brought them in as he spoke about uh, the thing that they were to do. This is an epistle written by Paul the Apostle. And then you can see that the second epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Thessalonians. But now, he spoke about them because uh, they had been working together. Even there was a soul also. Can I show you this in the chapter 2 verse 5? Chapter 2 verse 5, you see Paul the Apostle was a soul author of this. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you. I told you these things. You see, you see the personal pronoun there. It's writing to them. And he said, you remember when I came? You remember when I was with you? This is what I mentioned. And I'm saying that again. I wrote to you. I told you. I spoke to you. Uh, let's look at another verse there in chapter 3, verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 17. The salutation of Paul with my own hand. That clears it all. It's saying, I'm the one writing this to you. I'm greeting you. I'm cheering you up. I'm rejoicing with you. I'm encouraging you because you've done so well and I need to talk to you personally. It says the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is taken, which is the token in every epistle. So I write. It's not that we are writing. It's not the three of us just sending this to you. It's I writing this unto you. But even though that was the case, he still was able to bring in uh, Silas and also bring in Timothy. Silas uh, was a faithful missionary partner and he ministered effectively with Paul the Apostle. In the case of Timothy, he was for Paul's faithful son in the faith who frequently served as his emissary and representative sent him a lot of places. This team 
or supported ministers working wholeheartedly and working unitedly faithfully with Paul the Apostle had raised up heavenly minded churches in Thessalonica and in many other cities. The Thessalonians had genuine repentance and they were brought into vital union and relationship with God and Jesus Christ. That's why you'll find at the end of verse 1 that is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 1. It says in God our Father. That is all these people they came out of darkness they came into the light. God is light. They came out of their evil and they came into righteousness and holiness. They came into the very virtues of the Lord Jesus Christ and it says in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And you'll find that that's exactly how he even said it in chapter 1. Look at uh, First Thessalonians chapter 1 and we're looking at verse 1. When he wrote the first epistle it's the same thing he wrote to them. It says I'm grateful to God because we become a church, ecclesia, they called out one. And you are called out of sin, out of self, out of Satan, out of evil. You are being called into Christ, ecclesia, the church. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father. What a wonderful scene that at the time he saw them the first time in God the Father. Now he's writing to them the second time. They were still in God the Father. What if you are constant like that? What if you had a permanent relationship like that? And then we saw you some months ago, some years ago. You were in God the Father. You are also in Christ Jesus. And between that time and this time, nothing evil, nothing sinful, nothing polluting, nothing defiling, nothing evil has come in. You're still in Christ. And you're still in God the father and then he says grace be unto you can you imagine that when he wrote the first epistle to them grace be unto you now he's writing the second epistle and it's still the same thing grace be unto you and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ talking about this grace that is a grace be unto you isn't it important for us to know that the foundation of our christian life is grace and in the continuation of our christian life is grace and when you come to the end of the journey and then you are about to go up there to the great beyond. It's also still going to be of grace, which means from the commencement to the continuation to the culmination, it is always going to be by the faith and the grace of God in our lives. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 2, the grace of God, the grace that saves and the grace that sanctifies and the grace that makes us steadfast and remain unafraid or uninhibited in the things of the Lord. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. It says, for by grace grace are you saved wonderful by grace by grace is the divine favor is the merited favor is on the sub favor of god it's not something you have done not something i've done something we have done it is all by grace for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god and i pray that yours will be that gift every time in jesus name it says in verse 9, it says not of works, lest any man should boast. That is, we have nothing to boast about. If your life is turned around, praise the Lord. If you are now a new creature in Christ, praise the Lord. If the things I used to do, I do them no more, praise the Lord. We cannot condemn other people, look down on other people, belittle other people, walk on other people, insult other people, abuse other people, and say, look at what you are, see what I am. That would be boasting, but there's no place to boast, because it is all by grace. That's why it says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That is, he has saved us free of charge without anything that we have done, not of works. And yet, when he saves us, he saves us unto good works. We had no good works in the antecedent, that is, before and previous to that salvation, no good works, nothing good within us. But then the grace of God comes to us and appears to us and saves us. And then after that salvation, now he moves us and leads us into good works. That's why it says uh, unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. I pray that that grace will sit in your life. In Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11 all through to verse 14. This grace of God, how it operates in our lives. This grace of God works in our lives. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. And this ought to be your personal experience. You ought to be able to say, yes, I experienced that grace. I know that grace. I've got that grace 
grace, I've obtained that grace, and it's working effectively, effectually in my life as well. Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. You know, the grace of God never comes empty-handed. When the grace of God comes to you, it's bringing something, it's bringing something. It's bringing salvation, it's bringing righteousness, it's bringing the glory and the virtue of Christ, bringing that into your life. That's why it says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness. That's what grace does. Grace teaches us. You know, some people said, I never had that before. I never thought of that before. They never taught me that before. If the grace of God is in your life, the grace will not be silent. The grace will not be dormant. The grace will not be impotent or powerless. The grace will be teaching you effectually, effectively, teaching us that deny our godliness and worldly laws. We should live soberly. When the grace of God comes to us, it teaches us uh, there's a quiet voice, a silent voice, a small, still voice in us that the grace of God is working with every time. And it's telling us a child of God cannot go direction. A child of God cannot do this. A child of God cannot touch that. A child of God will not go this direction because the grace of God is teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly laws and then it teaches us to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world mark that in your bible because you know there are people that say you know nobody can be righteous in this world nobody can live a godly life in this world so much temptation and so much confusion and so much defilement. The street is dirty. The community is dirty. Their languages are dirty. Their dressing, their appearance is dirty. The temptation is too much. Nobody can live a righteous life. But he says, in this present world, when that grace of God comes to you, it will change you and turn you around. I say it will change you and turn you around. Thank God it's already done that for a number of people. And if you are not there yet, you're coming in Jesus' name. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. That's it. He gave himself for us. It's the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's what brought this grace. That's what brings this godliness and righteousness. That's what brings this transformation and change of life. If you had that anybody is a new creature, it's because Jesus Jesus Christ died for us. If you had that somebody now, his life has changed and the works of darkness, he cannot practice anymore and the evil things cannot do them anymore and the evil place, he cannot go there anymore is because Jesus Christ died for us and you realize it and you accept it and you receive that and you embrace that and you believe that and because of that faith, embracing, believing and holding on to what Christ has done for you on the cross of Calvary that change comes. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from how much iniquity? All iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You know, you, you see some people, they say, well, I'm saved, so, so salvation, so, so salvation. And there's no passion, there's no enthusiasm, there's no excitement, and there's no light, there's no joy. They're just dragging their feet. I'm saved, I'm a child of God. It's, it's almost like, you know, dragging them to church, you're dragging them to read the Bible, you're dragging them to study the word of God, you're dragging them to do what is their duty. And they, 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 there's there's so cold or there's so lukewarm, but it says when we are saved and then because we realize he gave himself for all that he might redeem us from all iniquity and then to purify unto himself. It doesn't purify us and then send us back to the world and say you are part of the world, but unto himself, a peculiar people, zealous of good works, and that's a zeal be fiery. And then when you go in the street, people know that that's a man that carries the fire and the passion and the focus and the fury of the Lord with him. And then you are zealous of good, good works. I pray that that will be your story. I say that will be your story. But you know that grace that we receive, I told you, we need to start with it and then we continue with it. In fact, that's what he's saying in Acts of the Apostle chapter 13. Reading there from verse 43. Acts chapter 13 verse 43. We commence with it. We continue in it. That is the grace of God comes in and then we continue in that grace because how are you going to be able to live a victorious life? Because to continue in the grace of God, how you be? How you going to live a life above reproach that you are standing steadfast every time because of the grace of God that came in at a particular time at the point of salvation and then continues and continues after you are born again. Acts chapter 13 and verse 43 says now when the congregation was broken up 
Many of the Jews and the religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas and who speaking to them persuaded them, listen to this, to continue in the grace of God. Persuaded them, convinced them that if you're going to be victorious and if your life is going to be meaningful in Christ, the way you are saved by the grace of God, you continue, continue in that grace. And he spoke to them persuasively and he spoke to them convincingly and he spoke to them driving them to a decision that we're going to continue in the grace of God. I pray that the way they were persuaded to continue the grace of God, you too, you'll be persuaded and convinced to continue in the grace of God in Jesus' name. In fact, uh, it's the, you know, people that do not continue the grace of God, they get into you know, a lot of other things, uh, confusing things and strange doctrines and strange behavior and strange association and strange uh, whatever it is that they get into. But I pray that God will preserve you and preserve me and preserve us as a church away from all that in Jesus' name. So we're established in the grace of God. We've commenced, we've started in the grace and then we continue. We're established and steadfast in that grace of God. In Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verses 8 and 9. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. It says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Can I tell something before I continue? You see, the Thessalonian believers, that's what happened to them. In first Thessalonians, they were in grace. And then they said, like Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master, as he continued and, con and the same yesterday, today, and forever with you. We're going to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Were we pure yesterday? We're going to remain pure today. Were we holy yesterday? We're going to remain holy today. Were we uncompromising yesterday? We're going to remain uncompromising today. Were we prayerful yesterday? We're going to remain prayerful even today. Were we loving yesterday? We're going to remain loving even today. We continue. We continue. Just like Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. But you know, the that some people, they change like chameleons. If they are, you know, in Rome, they be like the Romans. If they are in Lagos, the Lagos people. If they are now in Ghana, like, you know, Ghanaians. And then they are here and there. But the constancy of the grace of God, the constancy of the life we live, and the constancy of the doctrine that we believe, that you know that this is where you stand, this is where you stood before, this is where you are standing today. When we look at the two, you are still the same. Just like Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Look at verse 9 that follows that now. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Be not carried about. Be stable. Be steadfast and be constant and be persevering that you have conviction. You are a Christian that has real, real conviction like the Thessalonian believers were reading about. It says you are not carried about by strange doctrines and by diverse doctrines for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Establish with grace and not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. I pray that this constancy and perseverance in the Lord will grant to us in Jesus name. It's not just that you know you remain static as if you know it's like a student that went to school is in class one you know and remains in class one class one. You see the child after three years again. What are you doing now? Which class are, class one? And then now you know the fourth year class one. Hey move on. The same thing. And there are classes and levels of grace. You know I'll show you the word of God. Levels of grace. The grace we have. The saving grace. The sanctifying grace. The steadfast grace. The sustaining grace. And then you're moving Moving on and moving on and moving on. That's what Second Peter chapter three is telling us. Second Peter chapter three. Let's look at verse seventeen, verse eighteen. That you are not static. You're not just in the same place. You're moving on and moving on every time. So that just like students that go to school, you're able to, you know, get up and move to the second level and then go on and move to the third level and move on and move to the fourth level. The same thing, the levels of the grace of God you are moving on. We're going to move on in Jesus' name. We will not backslide. I said we will not backslide. And we're not going to remain static in the same place, the same years through our lives, remaining at the same place. You know, some people, they give testimony, I was saved, praise the Lord. After two years, I was saved, praise the Lord. After five years, I have saved, praise the Lord. Move on. There is something beyond that initial experience of salvation. The sanctification, holiness, purity of heart, circumcision of the heart. After that, there is the Holy Ghost baptism. And then you can say, praise the Lord, that's what I was and this is what I am now, 
because there is growth in your Christian life, growth in faith and growth in holiness and growth in love and growth in hope and growth in every area and virtue of your life. It will happen like that in Jesus' name. Let's look at it now. Second Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seen ye know these things before beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness it says remain steadfast don't allow anything to move you away and then to become shaky and unsure unstable and moved away by tossed about by every wind of doctrine by every opinion coming to the community but it says you remain steadfast and there's nothing that is going to make you fall away from your steadfastness look at verse 18 but grow in grace but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to him be glory both now and forever yeah. I thought to say good good amen yeah. you know if we say to him be glory in your life to him be glory in your family to him be glory in everything that you do people will see you and they glorify your father which is in heaven do you see what it says it says grow in grace that move on in grace get to the next level in grace and to the next level in grace and to the next level in grace in fact in first peter chapter 4 verse 10 see what it says about the grace of god it's a many-sided grace it's a manifold grace it's a grace that has this side to you and this side to you and this side to you and this side to it that you know is manifold and it's a multiplied facet of that grace look at the first peter chapter 4 verse 10 as every man has received the gift even so minister the same one to another as the good stewards of the manifold, many-sided grace of God. Manifold grace of God. What does that mean? Number one, there is saving grace. Saving grace. The grace that brought salvation has appeared unto us. Teaching us that in our godliness and holy loss, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There is saving grace. Not only that, number two, there is sustainable Sustaining grace, the grace that sustains us, the grace that you know is abiding every time. Temptation comes, challenges come, and then you go to God in prayer, and that grace of God sustains you. That's in Hebrews chapter 4, reading there the last verse in verse 16. It says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That sustaining grace sustains you, will not allow the wind of temptation or trial or tribulation persecution or whatever it is coming from the world will not allow those adverse winds to blow you down then number three there's supplicating grace that is a grace that helps to know how to pray we don't know how to pray but then the grace of god comes in the grace that convicted us of sin and the grace that made us to confess our sins the grace that made us to be able to pray to god cry to god for mercy and for salvation that grace also leads us to that real salvation then on and on and on in times of persecution and pressure trials and temptation the grace of God will teach us how to pray supplicating grace and then number four the sanctifying grace sanctifying grace and look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10 reading there from verse 29 Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 there's a grace that saves there's a grace that sanctifies the grace that purifies the grace that takes our hearts and is totally transformed and all those things of, of the Adamic nature everything is cleansed away and operated and taken away there and then it makes us to love God with all our heart all our soul and all our mind out a beautiful thing when that sanctifying grace when it gets hold of you and does the sanctifying work that's what we call it the second work of grace. We have salvation, the first work of grace, the first time we taste of the grace of God. Salvation comes, conversion comes, a new life comes, eternal life comes, but now the second time we go back again and we plunge in that cleansing blood again, the blood of Jesus Christ, and then sanctifying grace does an effective work in our hearts. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29, of how much sorrow punishment supposed he shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant, the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified and unholy sin. And now he has done despite to the spirit of grace. The spirit of grace. You see that the blood of Jesus 
You see here the substitutionary death of Jesus. You see there what Jesus paid as a price, a great price for sanctification. And then everything is now on the grace of God. Sanctifying grace. There's a grace that serves, the serving grace. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28. Serving grace. You see, that's what we're talking about. Growing in grace. That is, you are not static. You're not in the same position all the days of your life. You're growing and growing and growing and moving on. I pray that you experience this growth. I said you experience this growth. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28. It says, wherefore we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. That's the word again. That's the undeserved favor of God. Let us have grace. That's a merited favor of God. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God. God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You see, if you are going to serve God acceptably, God has made the provision. He says, my grace is available for you so that your service will be acceptable unto me. There is strengthening grace, the grace that strengthens us. Be strong in the Lord, in the grace of God. Not only that, number eight, there's great grace. It talks about the apostles. They came together and they prayed and the place was shaking where they were. And then it says, we're great grace. They spoke the word of God with boldness. Then there's more grace. He gives more grace to the humble. Then there's a super abundant grace that you'll find in First Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 8. Why don't you look at that? First Corinthians chapter 15 and there we're reading from verse 10. The grace that is sufficient. The grace that is super abundant. The grace that is over and over that makes you to be able to do more than them all. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, you'll be what you ought to be. And then it says, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. I pray that that grace will come in your life and multiply in your life in our lives together in Jesus' name. But uh, you know, when Paul the Apostle was writing to the Thessalonians, he also spoke about the peace of God. Abiding peace, abundant peace, and the peace that is always there that passes all understanding. We'll come to point number two now. The exceedingly growing faith of the brethren. We spoke about the grace they had. Now we're talking about the faith they had. And let's come to Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. It says, we're bound to thank God always for you. We're bound to thank God always for you. Let me stop there for a moment. You know, sometimes uh, you look at somebody and then you say, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. And then while you are thanking God for that individual, you know, the very next day they do something funny. And something that you say, ah, look at this person. I was thanking God for it. I thought that the work of grace had been totally done and wrought. I thought everything was now perfect. And then you are praying for them until Christ be formed in you again like the Galatian believers. But in the case of the Thessalonian believers, this was constant. And this was permanent. And this was continuous. That he was thanking God for them. In First Thessalonians, he praised God for them. He said, you are the crown of glory, the crown of rejoicing for me. And then in this second Thessalonians again, he's praising God for them. He says, always, every time. Not just, uh, you know, one day I praise God for you. And then the other day I say, I don't know what I'm going to say about them. He says, I'm praising God for them every time. The question is this. Why was he thanking God for them every time? time. As you notice in this episode, he didn't talk about, uh, you know, great big church building. He didn't talk about the number, the membership. There. It's not about number. And it's not about the building. It's not talking about the political power and authority they had. I heard that you selected some people and you went to, you know, the governor of your locality and now they say because of, you know, you have a large number. Well, it's not that. And it's not because they were, you know, like the world and the world praising them and glorifying them and saying, you know, those people good artists and theater people and they're like, you know, the Hollywood people. Nothing like that at all. Paul the Apostle was praising God for them because they were different. You'll be different. Separated from the world. You'll be separated in Jesus' name. And their life was free from the corruption, the defilement, and the morality of the land. And because of that difference and because of that separation from the world, he said, this is grace. If I ever saw any grace at all, this is the evidence of grace and was praising God for them, not for material possession, but for the indispensable virtue of their faith. And you know how important faith is? Because it says, but without faith, it is impossible 
possible to please God. Paul, the apostle, then was grateful to God because their faith was not static. They had a living faith. They had an abiding faith. And then a faith that was growing exceedingly. That means day by day, continually, the faith was growing. There are challenges. And as the challenges grew, then their faith also grew to match those challenges that they had so that they could remain faithful every time, victorious every time, and live above reproach every time. What made Paul grateful was not that the person had a growing size, a growing budget, a growing popularity or status society. It's joining you no know, bounds because they were growing from faith to faith. They were saved by faith, justified by faith, they lived by faith, they walked by faith, and they were sanctified by faith, and they stood steadfast in the faith. And they were able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked because of their faith. And that's what made him happy. And then they were able to withstand in the evil day. And then they were able to, to stand after doing all. And like Peter tells us, they were resisting the adversary of their souls. Steadfast in the faith. And they overcame the world by faith, according to First John chapter 5. And it is because of this kind of faith that the reason why Paul the apostle said, I just see you. I see the beauty and the glory of the Christian life in you. And I'm praising God God for you. Have you checked up the level of your faith of recent? How much you believe God? Have you checked up the level of faith of recent when you were persecuted and abused and insulted and they pushed you and they drew you and they dragged you and they did this and that and then your faith made you stable and steadfast. I pray that kind of faith God will grant you in Jesus name. And let's look at Romans. Romans chapter 1 and see what uh, you know this faith uh, does and what it did in the believers of old and what it's doing for us today as we're keeping on believing in the Lord. It says in Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Everyone that believeth. Everyone that believeth. Everyone, are they here tonight? I said, are they there tonight? I can't see them. Where are they? Praise the Lord. You see, oh God bless you. You see, when that gospel comes to you, it is the power of salvation. Nobody receives salvation and says, well, I don't feel the power. I don't sense the power. I don't know. There is a power that comes and makes a change in your life. If it has not happened like that, you go to Christ tonight to say, Lord, I'm hearing it about the power unto salvation. I want to see that power. I want to taste that power so that that power will make me totally different from what I used to be. It will happen to you. And then it says to everyone that believe it, the moment you believe, you'll taste and you'll see it you'll experience that power of salvation it says to the Jew force and also to the Greek. You know there are some people that uh, the, the way they understand Christianity they say well you know that tribe they're religious and because they're a religious tribe anyone that gets saved from that tribe I'm telling you they're always on fire. They're this and they're that but you know the tribe I came from where normally cold nothing interests us nothing really moves us even when we come to the Lord and we experience what we call salvation and the grace of God because of where we're coming from because of our locality because of our tribe that is how we are we're not like that other tribe that always zealous always on fire Whatever they do, whether they're doing business, they're fiery. Whether they're doing education, they're fiery. Whether they're doing this, whether it's politics or that, that's how they are. And when those people, when they come to religion, that is how they are. No, it says to the Jew force and also to the Greek, it's the same salvation. It's the same grace of God. It's the same gospel. And it has the same power to touch everyone and turn everyone around and transform everyone. So don't put the blame on your tribe. Don't put the blame on your country. Don't put the blame on your community or your country. You understand that when this grace comes to us and this power of faith comes to us, it will work in a dynamic way in every life. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's why it says in verse 17, I say for therein is the right righteousness of God revealed from faith unto faith. Revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith. You will live by faith. Then he tells us in chapter 3 verse 23 chapter 3 verse 23 unto verse 28 it says for all have seen and come short of the glory of God be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God are set forth to be a propitiation, that's the atonement, through faith 
in his blood is setting forth and the blood is powerful for everyone who believes the blood cleanses everyone who believes and the blood of jesus christ changes and transforms everyone who believes it says over here in the word of god is faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission removal cleansing forgiveness of sins that are passed through the forbearance of god to declare i say at this time is righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Where is the boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith faith without the deeds of the law. That means then if you hear Paul saying I'm saved, I'm justified by faith. You hear Timothy saying I'm saved, I'm justified. It's by faith. Silas, Silvanus is saying I'm saved, I'm justified. It's by faith. And you too, the only way you can be saved is by having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because he died for you. And now because of that faith you are saved by faith, you are now walking by faith. Walking by faith. That means that you are depending upon the Lord not on your strength, not on your ability and when challenges come, when temptations come, can I overcome this? Can I be victorious here? It's by faith and because of that faith other people have overcome. You too, you will overcome. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 it says, for we walk by faith. Here Paul did not say, I am walking by faith, but the rest of the people, I don't know whether you can have this or not. Everybody, this faith is available. We walk by faith and not by sight. And look at Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. This is a grace available, this faith available for you, for me, for everyone, for those in the good old days and for this, for the people in this modern time as well. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me can Satan conquer Jesus in you can temptations conquer Jesus in you allow Jesus to live big and to live strong in your life and then you'll find that all these temptations and trials they'll not be able to bow your head or bend you down it says I'm crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me he died for me he's my substitute it's my sin bearer he is my savior the final sacrifice because of that he gave himself for me I can lay by the faith of the son of God and when you are living by the faith of the son of God uh, the first thing it does to take every impurity away from your life from your heart from your surrounding it takes all the impurity away it purifies your heart by faith in Acts of the Apostles chapter 15 verse 9 Acts chapter 15 verse 9 it says but put no difference between us and them purifying their heart by faith if you have not been purified it means you are walking not by faith but in the flesh it's like you are looking at your strength temptation comes and then you are saying I will try, I will try by my self will, by my will power by my own ability. This one will not overcome me. And because it's all in yourself, that's why you're defeated. But when you're saying, oh Lord, I know you saved me. And I can be steadfast in you. I can be stable in you. This temptation is coming. This trial is coming. This persecution is coming. But I'm not going to stand in my strength. I'm going to stand in the strength of the Lord. And your heart will remain pure and holy and righteous because you are depending upon Christ and upon the faith that he gives. In fact, all the arrows of the devil, you will quench, you will conquer, you will break, you will crush, you will overcome. In uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, see what faith does. What faith does in our hearts, in our lives, when we really have this faith in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I'm going to read it in a personal way. This is for you. I said this is for you. Yeah. Above all, taking the shield of faith, that wherewith I shall be able. Can you say that? I, I didn't hear you well. I shall, I shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the way. Can you say that? How many darts of the devil are you able to conquer? Able to destroy? 
able to put out of the way all. That's why you don't say, well, uh, I'm facing this problem, I'm facing this challenge, I don't know what I'm going to do. Of course you know what to do. Because by the faith in you, you'll quench, you'll conquer, you'll crush, you'll destroy all the works of the devil and that victory will be yours in Jesus' name. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10 we're reading from verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading from verse 22. Here is what it says. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let us draw near. We're drawn near to God. We're not near to the throne of God. Let us draw near in the full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's why it says in verse 35. Look at verse 35 now. It says in verse 35, cast not away therefore your confidence. Your confidence in the Lord. Your trust in the Lord. Your faith in the Lord. That you know you say, what tempt whatever temptations come, whatever trials come, this one I have overcome already. I said you have overcome already. It says, cast not away therefore your confidence, your faith, your trust, which has great reward, great, com uh, great uh, recompense of reward. It says, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. The promise is coming your way. It says, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by, by struggling, by trying the best I can. The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And that means then, as we move on in the Lord, we're walking by faith and living by faith, and that faith is going to conquer in Jesus' name. Uh, you know what the apostle is talking about? To these thousand believers, number one, it said they had the conversion through faith. They had conversion, they were changed, they were transformed, everything turned around. Number one is conversion through faith. Number two, it is the commitment of faith. The commitment of faith because after they became converted, they were not, you know, going down and going up and backsliding and moving forward. They were stable. They were committed unto the faith that made them to be born again. They the commitment of faith. That means you make up your mind. I said you make up your mind. You'll make up your mind. You say, now I am in, I'll never go away again. I've come in, I've never go away. I'm going to remain with the Lord. I've decided, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. That's commitment. The world behind me and the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Others, whatever others do, I have decided that this way I'm going to follow through to the end, no turning back, no turning back. There is the commitment of faith. Then there's the courage of faith. The courage of faith. You know, there are people, they do not know that Satan has been defeated on the cross of Calvary. They fear Satan. They don't understand. Demons are being defeated on the cross of Calvary. They are fearing demons. They do not know that every human spirit, every human power, every kind of human contradiction coming against them has been defeated on the cross of Calvary. They fear a man. They fear a woman. They fear boys. They fear girls. They fear everything. They fear wind. They fear water. They fear almost everything. But now when you come to this faith, you know by the grace of God, we are not of them that draw back onto perdition we are them that are moving on to the saving of the soul because of that there is the courage of faith then there's the confession of faith you say i will overcome i will overcome i said i will overcome because that is what you believe you confess it and it is unto you according to your faith according to the confession of your faith in jesus name in second corinthians chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 13 second corinthians chapter 4 and we're reading there from verse 13 we have in the same spirit of faith according as it is written I believed and therefore have I spoken we also believe and therefore speak the confession of faith and then the contentment of faith contentment of faith you're so happy in the Lord you rejoice in the Lord he's giving me salvation what else do I want he's giving me peace of mind what else do I want he has even promised me he's making mansions for me upon high what else do I want and he says he's going to supply all my needs here on earth what else do I want he says he'll never leave me he'll never forsake me he'll be with me every time what else do I want you know sometimes it may be like you know a poor fellow for 
seeks you, the person that has nothing, even when the fellow was with you, there's nothing he's going to give to you. And then he says, I'm leaving you. And then you are sorrowful. Why are you sorrowful? The king of kings and the lord of lords is with you. And then there are mansions on high waiting for you. That's why you have the contentment of faith. And you say, whatever goes and whatever comes, I know that Jesus is always with me. And I'm satisfied. All things in Jesus I find. He satisfies. And joy he supplies. What will life be without him? Life without him will be miserable. All things in Jesus I find. That's what makes us to have that contentment. And then the consolation of faith. And then the conviction of faith. The conviction of faith. Romans. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 28 there. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. The conviction of faith. This is your conviction. And this this is a confession. It says, and we know, do you know? I will know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called, they called, according to his purpose. Then look at verse 35. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? You need to answer? Shall distress? Or persecution? Or farming? Or nakedness? Or peril? Or sword, then it says, Look at verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm coming back now to this uh, uh, church of the Thessalonians. The church of the Thessalonians, I told you that they this was a real church, a model church, a purified church, an exemplary church. And I told you that church, C-H-U-R-C-H, and those are converted hearts, unitedly reflecting Christ's holiness. Welcome to this uh, church now. You see their fellowship, and you see this kind of fellowship that, you know, was moving on in the things of the Lord. We're looking at Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounded, abounded. You know, the love that these people have for each other, they visit each other, they encourage each other, they lift up each other, they care for each other, and they united together to also go and evangelize. That's why you read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm reading there from verse 6, and you became followers of, of, of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction and joy of the Holy Ghost. Said, oh, this is church. This is church. And I pray that we'll be like this in Jesus' name. You know, some people don't understand what church is. They think church is a building. You see, a church is not good. What do you mean? A church is not, I, I'm talking about the building. Ah, you make a mistake. The building is not the church. The people are the church. I said the people are the church. We are the church. If we are good, that is wonderful. And eventually church building will become good in Jesus' name. Because it says over here, ye became examples and followers of us and of the Lord. It says so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward to God word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. These were evangelizing people. That is, they were soul winning people. They went everywhere in their community. They went everywhere everywhere and they were preaching the word and preaching the word and preaching the word and bring the souls from the harvest field and bring him back into the fold of the people of God. That's how they demonstrated their love towards God. They demonstrated their love towards each other. They demonstrated their love towards the unbelievers outside you. Maybe you want to write this down. This is church. Church. C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. That's Christ's household urgently reaping city harvest. You see, the harvest in the city, the harvest is ripe, and then all the people they are waiting, and then Christ household all of us, the men and the women, the boys and the girls, everybody that knows the Lord, were the household of God, the household of faith. It says, Christ household urgently reaping city 
harvest. That's why we're reaching out. We'll call it done. Disciple a whole nation. And we're doing that throughout the whole church, the household of Christ. Reaching out and urgently reaping the harvest of the community and the harvest of the city. And that's what these people, that's what they did. And I pray that this same spirit, evangelizing spirit that came upon them and it showed this kind of love pure love, undefiling love, this kind of love, I pray it will be among us too in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Peter, First Peter chapter 1 and I'm reading from verse 22. First Peter chapter 1 verse 22. It tells us in uh, this uh, passage, it says in First Peter 1 22, see ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. You have purified your souls in obeying that they were converted, they were cleansed. They were purified, they were sanctified. You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned, unpretending, unhypocritical love of the brethren. See that she love one another with a pure heart, not defiled heart, not a moral heart, not a kind of heart looking for something else, a pure heart fervently. That's the kind of love they had and that's the kind of love we are going to keep on manifesting in Jesus' name. In fact, uh, this love is so central and so important that except we have it, every other thing is worthless. Except we have this kind of love, every other thing is useless, unrewardable. But the kind of service and the kind of life that will be rewarded in eternity will be the life that is full of the love of God. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're looking at the kind of charity they had, their charity, that is their love toward each other, abounding, was like water overflowing its banks. And that's what you read over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The virtue of increased love was not demonstrated by just a few of them, but by everyone towards everyone else. They realized whatever our gifts and whatever our ability, whatever our skill, whatever it is we do, without love will be useless. That's why they were increasing and abounding in this kind of love and because of that it was a striking manifestation of the power of divine grace in their hearts and though persecuted yet they did not become so self-centered neither did they live in self-pity nursing their wounds and bemoaning their injuries they spent their time loving and caring one for the other the love spoken of here is not fleshly love sentimental love emotional love you know i touch you you touch me i hold you hold me not the love we're talking about i pull you pull me no this one is supernatural this one is sacrificial serving each other is the labor of love for me the entire congregation and they were all loving towards one another and they were all beloved of one another there was no division there was no separation in between them and there was no argument among them they constantly obeyed the timeless command of god by love serve one another and not only that by love you speak the truth in love growing up into him and were walking worthy for bearing one another in love and the world of one mind having compassion one of the other they loved as brethren, they were pitiful and they were courteous and they were not just loving in words or in tongue only, they were loving in reality and in truth look at it described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1 though I speak of the tongues of men and of angels and have no charity and become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal that is uh, whatever gifts you have skill, ability, excitement, you're fiery, you do this, you do that. Where is the love? Where is the love? Everything must be propelled by love. Everything must be initiated by love. Everything must be driven by love. And it says even though I do this, I do that, I have this, I have that, if I do not have this charity and this love, I am as nothing. Look at verse 2. It says, do I have the gift of prophecy? And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And, I have, and do I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity this love? I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Oh, this love then is charity is central, very essential, and very and much indispensable. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed off. It's not proud. It does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. It's not easily provoked. Doesn't get angry. 
thinketh not, thinketh no evil, he rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, able to endure persecution, difficulties, trials, like the Thessalonian believers, uh, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Our charity will not fail. Our love will not fail. That whether in the morning, afternoon, or evening, Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, weekend or Sunday, our love will remain constant in Jesus' name. Loving God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and loving our neighbor and loving the brethren, even as Christ has loved us. And I pray that all these great qualities we see in the church of the Thessalonians, the Lord will break all the virtues and all the qualities into your life, into my life, into our lives together in Jesus name and this our church will be a model church will be an exemplary church it's not just the responsibility of one person or two people it's ours together as we live the life I live the life we manifest the love and the faith and the grace together this church will continue to be a great church in Jesus name and this is the church the Lord has brought you to and others have manifested that love to make it great you will contribute your part this church through you and through us together will remain great in Jesus name let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that the Lord himself will help us that will manifest this grace abiding grace and continual grace and this kind of grace that makes us to be the kind of believers the kind of children of God that we ought to be open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord help me you helped those Thessalonian believers you can help me too are you not born again tell the Lord yes I'm born again I want to move on I'm born again I'm saved I'm a child of God I want to be sanctified I want to be purified and I want this grace of God to work mightily 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 in my life. You tell the Lord he did it for those Thessalonian believers and Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever he'll do it for you. He did it for those other believers in those good old days and God says I'm God, I change not. My word changes not. My grace changes not and the faith changes not and it is still there today. Why don't you just tell the Lord, oh Lord here am I, here am I, here am I accomplish it and fulfill it in my life he will do it you know how simple it is to be saved if you have not been born again you have not been saved just realize you are a sinner because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and then believe Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary and you say Lord I believe Lord I believe I turn away from all my sins I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. He is mine. He is mine. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He cannot push you away. He cannot reject you. As you come to him, receive him. As many as received him, to them he gave grace. The power to become the sons of God. Even as many as believed on his name. By grace, I'm saved. By grace, I'm saved. By grace, I'm saved. We we'll start with grace, continue with that same grace of God. By grace, I live and overcome in life. By grace, I live a righteous life. By grace, I live a victorious life. By grace, I overcome all my temptations. A day at a time, one day at a time, a step at a time, facing one challenge at a time, you become an overcomer. One hour passes, another hour comes. One day passes, another day comes. And you overcome hour by hour, day by day, moment by moment. That grace is available for you. Saving grace. Sanctifying grace. Sustaining grace. Steadfast grace. Supplicating grace. The grace that leads you to pray. Teaches you how to pray. Supplicating grace. Sufficient grace. 
no matter what you are going through my grace is sufficient for you super abundant grace as your day so shall your strength be strengthening grace be strong in the grace of the Lord and in the power of his might you will not fall you will not look back you will always be an overcomer let your face be dynamic let your face be dynamic. By grace, are you saved through faith? Faith. Wonderful faith. There's a conversion of faith through faith. Because you believe, whether Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile, that faith brings conversion, transformation. A new life. Eternal life. There's a commitment of faith. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me. The cross ever before me. No turning back. No turning back. The commitment of faith. Commit yourself and lay everything on the altar. The confession of faith. I believe, therefore, have I spoken? It's going to be until you according to your faith. You say, I'm an overcomer. You're an overcomer. I'm victorious. You'll be victorious. I'm more than a conqueror. You'll be more than a conqueror. By that faith you'll quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You'll be able to stand in the evil day. No temptation, no trial will be able to defeat you. Keep on standing. Keep on standing. Don't let the devil deceive you that you cannot stand. Of course you can stand. By faith you have saved. By faith you stand, walk by faith, live by faith, overcome by faith. This is the faith that overcomes the world. That faith is in you. You are an overcomer already. And remember the Lord is coming back. He's going to prepare a place for you. Begin by grace, continue by grace. And you go through to the end, endure to the end by grace and by faith. You helped other people, upheld other people, sustained other people. It'll help you, it will uphold you, it'll sustain you to the end by grace. Through faith.